let's look at the discrete Fourier transform of a sinusoid. So let's start by considering this continuous time signal and assume that we're going to sample it uh, with 100 samples, just as an example, in per second. And let's say we sample it for one second. So we're going to sample it over this period here with 100 samples in there. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, this means we've got an angular frequency of uh, 2 pi. So the angular frequency here is 2 pi uh, divided by 100 because the sinusoid goes through one cycle in 100 samples. We're sampling it with 100 samples per second. Okay, so in uh, MATLAB, for example, we could write this as uh, x equals sine of 1 to 100, we're taking 100 samples, um, or times 2 times pi uh, divided by 100. Okay, so this is our signal in MATLAB that represents sampling this 100 times in a second. And then we could put this into an F the FFT, which is a fast way of calculating the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, and then we could plot the absolute value of we could plot the absolute value of our Fourier transform, our discrete Fourier transform. Okay, and what would we expect to see? Okay, well let's uh, think about what our discrete Fourier transform is, and just remind ourselves of what the uh, how the vector is made up. Okay, so the vector is as long as the number of samples that you've taken. So in this case, it would be 100 samples long. Uh, the first sample is zero, which is DC, because this is in the frequency domain, uh, in the frequency domain. So this represents zero frequency. Uh, and the sample, which is one more than halfway along, so at 51, is the Nyquist frequency. So in angular frequency, that is pi there. Okay, so where are we expecting to see, uh, what are we expecting to see in this Fourier transform of a sine wave? Don't forget the sine wave only has one frequency component, so in the DFT we're just expecting to see one element that's not equal to zero. And where do we expect to see them? Okay, so uh, we'll, we've got Nyquist here as pi. Uh, each of these elements along here is at, uh, if this is m, counting along here, 1, 2, 3, and so on, uh, the nth element is at frequency m minus 1 uh, times 2 pi divided by m if m is the total. So in this case, m equals 100. Okay, so that's the frequency of the nth element along here. Okay, and what is the frequency of our waveform here? 2 pi divided by 100. Okay, so here's the formula for the mth one along here. M, capital M equals 100, so this is going to be a spike at little m equals 2. So 2 minus 1 will give us 1. So we've got 2 pi on 100, that's the frequency of this sinusoid. So for the sinusoid that we have chosen with the, this sinusoid here, when we've got uh, 100 elements that we have sampled, we've sampled for 100, then we're going to see a spike in the second element. Okay, so we're going to see a spike in the second element, and also we're going to see a spike in the uh, 100th element. Okay, because the 101 element here, which we don't have, but if we did have it, the 101th element is 2 pi, which is equivalent to the zero frequency, because in, uh, in um, the basis functions repeat in discrete time. Okay, so in this case, uh, we would be having them, the, the, sam the spike would be uh, at, uh, in element two and in element 100. Well, what if we had measured for a longer period of time? Let's say we'd measured for a thousand instead of just for 100. Well, in this case, our vector here would have, instead of 100 elements, we would have 1,000 elements, so capital M would be 1,000, but still halfway along plus 1 would be the Nyquist. So this would be in element 501, this would be 1,000 elements along here. And so now, but our frequency hasn't changed, we just sampled for a longer period of time. 
Okay, so the first one still represents 0, but now 501. And so here we can see in here, therefore, our frequency stays the same. So where is, which value of little m would give us 2 pi divided by 100? But now we've got 2 pi divided by 1000, because we've taken 1000 measurements. So 2 pi divided by 1000, so we have to have 10. M, little m minus 1 has to equal 10, so that's the 11th element. So in this case, the 11th element would have uh, a spike in it, and also we would have uh, the, the, so this is uh, um, the DC1 plus 10, and this one would be, let's see, the DC1 is just off the end of this, so minus 10 uh, from uh, the, the DC1 would be uh, 100 and down to um, uh, 91. Okay, so you'd have that there in the 90, 991st element. Okay, so if you'd taken a thousand, this is when m equal to thousand, uh, and this one here when we said they were in uh, two and so on, that was for m equals 100. Okay, so the frequency didn't change, uh, but we got more elements in our measurement vector, and so we had more elements in our DFT. So the spikes now appear at different elements in that vector just because it's longer, but the frequency didn't change. We just filled in with more resolution in the frequency domain. That's the way to think of it. We sampled for longer, which means we got more resolution in the frequency domain. Another thing that sometimes uh, people think about is, well, if, what if we didn't sample from uh, 1 to 100? What if we sampled from 2 to 101, for example, or any other time offset? Well, we're still going to have our spikes in the same places. We, we've just got a phase offset. So here we're plotting the absolute, but if we plotted the phase, you'd see a difference. One other thing is to see what happens, and you can do this yourself in MATLAB, if you don't sample for an entire period. And this is an interesting thing to do. What the discrete Fourier transform does, as you will recall, is it assumes that what you have sampled is periodic. It assumes that your samples, your finite vector, repeats itself in time. That's the assumption. So if you sampled, let's say, for only 75, for example, uh, instead of sampling for 100, you'd sampled at the same rate, but just for 75. Then you would have a signal that looks like this uh, here. So you'd have this part of the signal here, but it would stop there. It wouldn't do that last bit. You'd just be sampling this amount. If you'd sampled at the same rate, but for only 75 samples, you've sampled up to here. And then what the DFT does, it assumes, that's the bit that you've sampled, but it assumes that that repeats itself. So it's assuming that your waveform actually looks like this, with a vertical line here, and then the sine wave starting again, and a vertical line. And this waveform, so a vertical line down here, and so on. So this waveform here clearly is not just a sine wave. It's a parts of a sine wave with vertical lines. Part of a sine wave, vertical lines. And so this waveform will not look as clean with just a single sp a s two spikes, the positive and the negative frequency. Don't forget this frequency wraps in uh, bit to the z negative pi to zero is these ones here. So it's the positive frequency and the negative frequency. Um, and so in this case, it's not just like that. And you can see that it has the Fourier transform of this function uh, will appear. And that's actually spikes smoothed out. And that's an interesting thing to do in MATLAB. So plot this from 1 to 75 and see uh, what the effect is that you get. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel uh, for more videos and like this video. Uh, it helps to get the word out to other people who are interested. Uh, and also look at the related videos uh, that are linked at the end of this video um, to see explanations of uh, what is the DFT uh, and other videos.